All right, now we will move on to the South region. They get another look at the Sweet 16 there. The South region, though, has got a very intriguing matchup there, and it begins with the one seed Houston against the four seed Duke. Isaac, you had talked about Duke as your final four pick on last week's show. Are you sticking with that pick? Double down, baby. Double down. This is one of the most talented rosters in college basketball, and I think we're starting to see them play a little bit like it. I, you know, everybody just panics when Duke loses a couple games, and now they get the draw, right? Everyone's talking about, oh, is Vermont a potential upset pick for them? They were able to take care of business even on a night when I didn't think they played that well offensively. And James Madison, a team that really put Wisconsin in the torture chamber defensively, I thought Duke just completely erupted. And that's the version of Duke that can win the national championship. Now, can they do that again against Houston? I think it's a fascinating matchup. There's a lot of nuances here, but I keep going back to big men who can pass against Houston. That's going to be enormous. I think Kyle Filipowski's decision-making is going to really loom large in this one because if he can make those quick, you know, 0.5 second basketball, make, make the make, catch the ball and make a quick decision in a hurry. And if he can do that, I think there are open threes to be had against this Houston defense. And if Jared McCain's hot, if Jeremy Roach can get healthy and stay hot, if Tyrese Proctor can knock down shots, that's when I think this Duke team gets into a different gear. So give me Duke and a little bit of an upset over a Houston team that I think is a bit vulnerable just with all the injuries and just with how this roster has progressed on the stretch. I'm still terrified about the number of shots that Houston gets at the rim, the lowest rim rate in college basketball this year the, uh, from a high major team. I'll keep going back to it all year until they lose. All right, Chris, he's taking Duke. You, you agreeing or are you pushing back on that? Listen, I love his smile and enthusiasm, but this game had, comes down to one thing and one thing only. Put your hard hat on, put your, bring your lunch pail. Duke, listen, I love their talent. They've always been a program that's had tremendous talent. But I know Kelvin Sampson, and he relishes the moment where his older guards, right, were like Shred and Cryer, Sharp, can play against guys like Proctor and McCain. He loves that. He This is something that is – as a matter of fact, I guarantee you think he's going to watch this and listen to what Isaac just said, and he's going to show his team. It's going to be like red meat. They're going to dig into the Duke Blue Devils like you've never seen before. And listen, this game is all about a fist fight. That's what he's going to do. And if Duke is not prepared, Isaac, you made great points about Kyle Filipowski. But let me just tell you something. If Kyle Filipowski doesn't, as Mike Tyson would say, everyone has a plan until they get hit. They're going to punch Punch, punch. And that game last night, guys, was indicative of an unbelievable college basketball game where four of Houston primary players fouled out. I mean, it was a war. The question is, is Duke ready for war? Because arguably, Kelvin Sampson the last five years has had the most successful program in college basketball. He just hasn't won a national championship. They're, they're not sexy. The names don't ju jump off the board when you say the University of Houston. People disrespect to me. Jamal shed to a degree, but guess what? He replaced Marcus Sasser, who was a first team All-American, and look what he's doing this year. It's Kelvin Sampson and his culture all day long. And again, it's going to be a fist fight. And if, you know, Jared McCain is not making eight threes against the University of Houston Cougars. They put two guys on the ball and they fly to the rim with reckless abandon. So if Duke is ready for a fist fight, there's no team in the ACC like the University of Houston Cougars. They haven't seen that. Now, I thought, you know, the Dukes, they put the paws on Wisconsin. Duke was not having it, period. But Duke is supremely more talented, even though uh, Wisconsin is a more experienced team. Duke has far more talent. Now, the question is, again, we, we talked about the, the uh, um, Illinois game, offense versus defense. This is experience versus talent. Experience versus talent, and even experience versus talent on the sideline with John Shire and Kelvin Sampson. I think – the fact that it's in Dallas, Texas, I'm going to give the Cougs the nod. Well, if they're putting Isaac's uh, clip on the uh, Houston locker room, we're going to send yours to the Duke locker room, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say that all year long, I've been saying the same thing about Duke. I want to see the three guards play well on the same night. They had never done it until that James Madison game. You get Tyrese Proctor, you get Jared McCain, and you get, uh, you get uh, Jeremy to all have 15-plus points in the same game. They all shot over 50% uh, from the floor, and they had a combined 12 assists to one turnover. If they can click on the same night, that's a different Duke team than we've seen throughout the course of the season. I hadn't seen that all year long. Now, part of that was because Caleb Foster's out of the lineup uh, with, with injuries. They got a little less backcourt depth, Jalen Blake's being inserted there. 
Filipowski was in foul trouble. He only played 21 minutes, so it was all about the backcourt. It was the first time all year long I saw that trio play off one another. And if they can do that against Houston, I think they have a chance. But I think you both make tremendous, tremendous points. That's certainly one of the most intriguing games uh, coming up this week. Let's stay in the South, and we're going to go down to the uh, the next side of the bracket here. And we got Marquette against Cinderella, NC State, uh, continuing to make some waves after winning that ACC championship. So, uh, Chris, going to start this one with you. Who do you like in this matchup? Are you sticking with toughness here? Listen, I'll say this. You know, last night a DJ saved my life. You know, we'll just find all the DJ songs. So DJ Horn and DJ Burns, I think in a lot of ways, helped Kevin Keats, you know, uh, save his not want to say save his job because we don't know that but losing four years. games straight yeah a lot of people were you know speculating there could be some change uh at nc state and look what he did with his group and that's what it's all about that's about rallying your team at the right time and i hesitate to call him a cinderella fink because you're talking about the champion of the atlantic i mean of the uh, acc as an 11 seed when does that ever happen 11 seed champion of the acc that's who you get right to play against who's playing unbelievable let's not get forget about michael o'connell he's playing great as well as not just the djs that are doing it and i think at the end of the day kevin keys has found something he's playing inside out and that and they benefited from that because they have a, people could talk about zach Eady, but dj burns inside is a force as well if you feed him the ball and they don't have the right type of scheme and they can play inside out and they can make shots casey more so like this team is something to be feared and to me it's a tough matchup to say they're playing against a cinderella only because they're seated on the other side marquette without question guys i think we would all agree Tyler Kolick is one of the best. I call him the Patrick Mahomes of college basketball. Like this guy, it doesn't matter who you put him on the court with. Again, he can, he's a general of mass proportions. He can make, I mean, it, this kid is phenomenal. As a point guard, former point guard myself, I love watching a kid like him play. And, he, he, and think about the others. You know, you're talking about Chase Ross. I mean, who's Chase Ross? I mean, does anybody know who he is? I mean, think about it. David Joplin, good player. Igadoro, I mean, not household names. But you put him out there, and, and Cam Jones, who was shafted by not being an all Big East player, you put Tyler Kolick out there, and anything could happen. He had 20, I, mean, I don't think they're ever been a Big East player. I think he had 21, 11, and five. No yeah. Big East player in the history of the NCAA has had 20, 10, and five in the game 10 assists, five rebounds. This dude is amazing. And again, coming back, like Shaka made the right decision, letting me get healthy. But it comes down to this their defense, their defense, their defense. It's going to be interesting. They play a short bench, bringing Ben Gold off the bench, who can stretch D.J. Burns. D.J. Burns is going to have to come out of that lane. Igadora doesn't make threes, but he's similar to Kolek, where he's a point forward and he can make plays, and he's very agile. It all, and you mentioned before about Filipowski being in foul trouble. He gets in foul trouble against Duke, against Houston. It's a wrap. If D.J. Burns gets in foul trouble, I don't think there's any way that ends because he's their weapon. You know, he's their weapon that Illinois, I mean, that Marquette has not faced at all in the Big East because he's different than Klingon because they force feed him. They don't really throw the ball to Klingon at UConn. So, again, if Igodar gets in foul trouble, I think it's a tough matchup for Marquette. But, again, the other side of that, if they can pull Burns out and get him in foul trouble and let Tyler Kohler get to that left hand, it's going to be tough for NC State. I'm taking the Golden Eagles. They're going to they're gonna put Burns in ball screens all day long. And if Igadar is making that little floater off the short roll, you know, Burns is going to yeah. play drop coverage. They're going to hit no the doubt. short roll. And if Igadar is making that floater, which we know he can, uh, it, it's going to be interesting. Isaac, who you got in this one? You took the words out of my mouth with the ball screen coverage. That's the key here. And it's the decision making. It's the decision making from Kolek that I think is going to really be a, a game changer for Marquette and for Burns as well. Because if you watch that tape against UConn and Marquette in the Big East tournament, Burns is going, hey, if I get single coverage, feed me the ball. Like, I, let me go to work because I'm going to go get my 20 piece tonight. And that's the thing. I think Marquette has to double the post there. And Burns, I think he's a tremendous passer. His playmaking is awesome. So if he's making the right decisions and spraying that out, that's big time. One underrated note, too. We talk a lot about ball screens that Marquette runs. They also invert their ball screens in really interesting ways. You'll see Kolek set some ball screens for Igadaro. I'm fascinated to see how DJ Burns handles that because he's not going to be put in many situations like that throughout the season. That could be an interesting nugget to try to get Marquette a couple easy buckets. I think Marquette has enough here. Cam Jones is a complete X factor here. He is a complete assassin playing at a really high level. If he's able to get off the bounce and get to the rim like he's been doing and also hitting the threes, they're just a ridiculously tough cover. 
Yeah, Cam, Cam Jones is a dude. Like, I, we all saw it in the Big East tournament. Tyler didn't play. Nobody thought Marquette was a factor. They get to the final, uh, and it was a coming out party for Cam Jones. My question, I'm going to pose this each to you real, very quickly before we, we before we move on. Who guards Burns for Marquette? Is that a Gadara or is that Joplin? With, who are they going to put on Burns? And Because I don't think they can double him because then he picks you apart with the passing. So which of those guys can guard him? I, I think that's you – know, we talked about how they are going to attack Burns, but who guards Burns is an interesting subplot for me. Chris, who would, who would you put on him? Listen, I'm going to put a Gadara on him, and I'm not going to okay. double him. So how many – the way I look at it from a coaching standpoint, how many points is he going to make? He's going to get 30? If I take away the three-point shooting, again, if he goes 10 for 20, that's 20 points. Don't foul and put him on the line. At the end of the day, you take away the shooters. You'll you'll allow – and, again, you're hoping that he has an unbelievable game, and you cannot foul him. That's the thing. you got to try to fight him, you know, push him out as much as you can, and really put pressure on the passers. But that's what I would do. Yeah. Took the words right out of my, my mouth. There's got to be ball pressure there from the guards and make that, that entry pass more difficult.